My name is Beatrice Parwatiker and I live in Shoreham, Vermont. And maybe if you could just start by talking about how you formed your ideas about um, where you wanted to work in the world and how you see, how you saw poverty and then the transformation that occurred into where you are. Well, I come out of a, a civil rights background and connecting that civil rights to poverty was quite easy because at the time the opportunities were less for people of color in the United States because that's where I started. And then expanding that to look at the fact that along came the women's movement and I saw myself a part of that as a woman and as a woman of color. I have a different view maybe about it. I also looked at the fact that women, an issue for women are children, and that added to my list. But the reason I say poor also, as a woman of color, I cannot just look at a woman's poverty, because in, in people of color, it affects the whole community. So I don't want to say I would just work with the needs of the women of color in poverty and not the men. I must consider all. So that is the reason I work on the issues of poverty, race, women, and children. And for me, that crosses into environmental. I don't put that as a list, but you must have a healthy planet if you hope to sustain people and give them food. So that is the reason, to me, it's just all part of it. And we're seeing global warming, for instance, affecting poor people in the global south. Mm -hmm. And how do you see women as being an especially important factor in addressing poverty? Women are, I may almost sound sexist in this, but women very much are the people who, when you give them a small amount of money in a village or place, they immediately apply it to the best for the whole community because they want to lift their children and grandchildren up. They tend to want peace. Um, for instance, that loans that have gone to women have been paid back 98%. Loans that are going to men have not been paid back very well and the money has not been used to empower and make other people better, lives better, they usually are used on things like liquor, motorcycles, things like that. So now, for instance, the USAID gives 98% of their loans to just women because this is a proven factor that women enhance their community with their loans. And in terms of support other than financially, do people go in and work with women? I'm just wondering whether um, the women can use this money effectively or whether there might be a, the man trying to take it from them or someone else trying to take it or the government not really providing. Well, usually on, on the small areas like this, money is given in, and they work in a group. So what happens is you have kind of like a loan group and these women meet together and they're supporting each other through the person's loan. So that way it is not put in the hands where it can be taken by the men. And the loan will be required to be used exactly as said. And the women will do that. And usually, um, I actually saw this in Tanzania where women got $100 a hundred dollars, U.S. dollars, and one woman, they required that when they took this loan, they also found it wasn't just for them, but they had to in some way use other workers in the community. And these women with these hundred dollar loans would put everyone to work. Wow. Can you talk a little bit more about your other personal experiences and how those might have formed your opinions? Well, I think some of them um, have informed my opinions. I was, as I said, part of the women's movement, the traditional women's movement. 
um, and decided that it was not wide enough for me. I could not just be a person pointing my finger at men, particularly men of color. Also, I found that the traditional women's movement tended to favor educated women, women at a higher level. So there was a group form later of women of color, and I joined that group because, as I said, we have to be there in interest to open the glass ceiling. We have to bust the glass ceiling, but we also need to worry about the waitress who's serving. And that is the kind of thing that made for me, watching how sometimes people who are in social justice are not aware of how they treat the person who's maybe serving them the lunch. And that's being respectful. Remembering to learn respect. Recently, I've taken up a new motto. My motto is humility, compassion, and forgiveness. Um. So how do you reconcile being able to um, address all of your foci with poverty and women and children and the environment? Um, and I don't remember what your last one was. Um, women, children, poverty. Yeah. And racism. And racism. Um, how do you? How are you able to encompass all of those things? Or do you think? there are ways in which different groups might focus and then it works together? Um, very few things are straight in social justice. Very few things just, it's just this. You can narrow in on one thing, but if you're really looking at a problem, you're going to have to look at it over a range. And one of the things I am working on is Jubilee, which is uh, working on international debt issues, um, things like uh, people, what we call tax sanctions and stuff of this type, people leaving. But I also feel as if I have never ever worked on anything that was, you go in and you work on one thing and you cannot, like if you were going to work in a village on the issue of just say environment, you couldn't just go in and discuss environment. You would have to discuss the poverty, the problems that are in that village. So if you ever think that you're going to be able to work on something straight, it isn't that way. I think a good way to tell you is that when um, botanists and stuff go into a new area to learn the field, they take an environmentalist, they take a botanist, they take many other people who specialize in fields, and everybody works on their field within that area because you will not get a true picture of the area unless you have all those specialties there. It's the same thing when you're dealing with humanity. Yeah. Um, do you have any examples of times in which you've been involved in something where they didn't do that and you saw the effects, or a time when they did and you saw how successful it was? Um, I remember um, we were planning something and we did not include the community. And when it ended, I realized that it was not at all addressing the community. It, it did not represent the community. We were working on something and we were not listening to people. We were going ahead and it was a welfare conference. And it was supposed to be welfare women were involved, but we just wind up planning it on our own levels and not listening to the women themselves. Um, so in the long run, the women felt like the meeting wasn't theirs at all. It was a place for educated women to come and present papers. And in the sense, it was. And it wasn't a balance of work or things of that sort. So that was a bad outcome, I will say that. Um, when I went to Tanzania and I was the guest of the Catholic women of Tanzania, I only had two things that I knew when I left this country, United States, was one, the, the flight I was leaving on and the flights I was going to get, and two, the day I was leaving and the flights. The whole other part was planned by them. I learned immensely by just having to be in their world 
and travel and do all the things over the country that they did. I would never have experienced that. It was an interesting thing because I came back and that very week that I arrived home, the New York Times had this big spread, go to Tanzania. It was a $5,000 a week trip. It was fabulous. I was reading it and I was going, I never saw any of that. <laughs> you know, and I was in Tanzania. But I'm sure they would never see what I saw. So it's being able to, I came, they had idea of who I was and what I could do, and they used me to their best advantage. And I learned a lot. Yeah. What were they working on and what did you, what were you able to help them? They were working, um, they were just beginning in the Catholic Church to set up human rights offices and social justice offices. They had never had them. I had worked in one of the most successful human rights offices in the Catholic Church in the United States. And I advised bishops. They asked me to meet with the bishops. I had no idea I was going to meet with bishops. Um, I then asked me, they would take me someplace, and I would give talks. I wind up giving two and three talks a day. I didn't know that was going to happen. And I would be in one place, and I would go another place, and another place. But just advising women on how they, and encouraging them. Because a lot of times they were made to feel that they were less. And like I said to them, you are poor. Don't let anyone tell you you're poor because you don't work hard. You're poor because you don't get the right pay. If you were getting the right pay, you'd be rich. Mm -hmm. You know, I met a woman there who had invented all these things that was being used by the people. And I said, my God, in the United States you'd be a millionaire. You know, but you're here. And it was helping her community, but that's the difference. Um, it was the person I traveled with eventually was part of the treasury of T in Tanzania. So I was with people from every level. I mean, I went to a woman who ran a line business that she did it by hand. I had never seen work done like this by hand. Um, so that is the whole thing. I learned a lot. They, they learned from me how to do things how to set up things, and also they felt as if they learned, one of the things they told me they learned from me, which was funny, I didn't, wasn't teaching that. Sometimes you're teaching and you don't know. They said to me, we noticed that every woman's the same to you. I said, what do you mean by that? They said, it doesn't matter if they're poor or if they're wealthy or if they're middle class, in the middle, they're all the same to you. You like them all. I'm going to remember that. And that, to me, was one of the best things in my life. That if, if, if anybody could say that about me when I die, that she treated everybody the same, mm -hmm. I would love it. And that, to me, was a wonderful compliment. And I considered, I came back and I wrote an extensive thing about it. Um, and it was, it was a really good trip for me, for the people there. They felt they got... Um, benefits, and for dipping into culture, I danced 10 blocks through Dar es Salaam in the street. <laughs> Not everybody gets to do that yeah. <laughs> with 100 African women. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it sounds like there are a lot of benefits um, and good things that have come from travels you've done, but I know that you're also uh, you also find um, local community and working within your own area to be very important. So how do you um, manage to do both? Well, I have worked and I still work with the, the Coalition for the Farm Workers. But I have also done things for neighbors and friends. I had a woman, one of the people in my towns daughter was very sick. I did exactly what she needed. And someone said to me, I learned a lesson from that. You didn't go take her a pie. You didn't go take her a casserole. You found out what she needed. And what she needed was she needed someone to help her pot plants because she had a nursery. And I sat there and potted plants in the dirt. She showed me what to do and I did it. <laughs> and that's what she needed because she had to make an income. 
So you do what is needed. Somebody might need a ride. I do simple things like that. I mean, somebody does need food sometimes. I have even in my town helped do the, um, the meals for when we have a town meal. I'll do those type of things. So I learned to do all those things. I also remember to advocate on a national level and things of this sort, the things that are important because immigration is important. I am really focusing on immigration because I think that would help the people in the long run that are in the farm workers' problems if immigration would pass. And you need, I need to focus on that, and I do focus on it. Um, so um, you said that you grew up in New York and you've moved, moved around um, now in Vermont and in St. Louis for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, have you noticed a difference in the ways communities in urban versus rural areas work? Um, oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. In the urban area, for instance, you are going to not have a volunteer fire department. You're going to have a, a, a professional hired people who are fire department. Um, people who are working first responders, um, you're going to have uh, a lot more um, structure that's built as part of government in a sense. But what happens is in the rural area you do not have as much and a lot of times it is relying on the volunteers, the neighbors, the people who will do this. There is a step back in time sometime when you move into a rural area of Vermont and realize that you have to be a part of that community and help out as opposed to it's not my problem in the city you can you know there's someone who'll come there's people who deliver food there's all of these things that you have that you don't have as easily access I have noticed that um, the other thing is the <laughs> People know a lot more about your business in rural areas than they do in urban areas. No, that's, that's very true. Yeah. And kind of on a similar note, how have you seen difference in the ways government programs um, helping poverty might work versus communities started just locally um, homegrown programs? I think local homegrown programs are good. And I, I think they should be helped and assist. But there are times with larger things, you have to have larger government programs. If you're trying to improve schools or make something of that tradition, you need help from a, a larger source. For instance, uh, Andy Casey Fund did some research and found out that young men that are in prison a great portion of them, like was like 90, over 98, maybe 95 to 98 percent, did not do well in reading on the third grade reading test, national test. That is something that could be implemented where we would require reading programs for those students who did poorly. That would be an extreme change in the country because you're paying 35000 to 45000 to keep that person in prison. If we could have maybe spent $5,000 down here, you would have made a difference. The problem would be in a rural area or a community area or a community school, they may not have $5,000 for that special instruction. But as a larger government, it would be sensible for us to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and could you talk a little bit about your work um, in the various programs you've been involved in that are related to government and how, uh, how you work with uh, the U.S. government and other governments but also try to keep your own values and agenda? Um, I have learned, I think being a Catholic, this helps you learn that when you go into a wider community, for instance, we will not work on abortion issues or birth control issues, but I can work on, work on water issues, housing issues, other issues. What I can't work on, I don't work on. 
And I will work even with the government as far as I go on things that I feel are within my realm. And I will be supportive and, and, and learn. I've learned over the years, don't burn your bridge, because I was a bridge burner. <laughs> and when I used to burn my bridges, I had no way to go back. <laughs> so I have learned that if I can't work on this, I will bow out in a way graceful enough that I can go back. But some of the programs, this particularly Jubilee, is a program you have to work, USA, you have to work with governments, you have to work with the Treasury, you have to work with the, you want to be able to have insight into G8 meetings that have happened in the world, well you have to work with the Presidential Office, you have to work with IMF, you have to work with the World Bank, you have to work with Congress then, particularly the Senator Banking Committee. So, and also we're trying to get a law passed so in the, in the government, and we have two sponsors, and we're working with them. And so you're always doing this type of work. I was in a meeting a few months ago, first of November, where I was in the Capitol, and we had a reception and, you know, for the AIDS educational. And so it was the AIDS of congressmen, um, the Treasury Department, and the State Department people came and you're speaking. So you have to be able to be able to work with them. There are people who believe you never work with governments. You never do anything. But I learned a long time ago, if you're not at the table when the table is set and the food is served out, you're, it's going to be over. So you need to be there when they're making the plans. And the one thing that I always try to remember when I'm at a table or in a, in a community. I'm always trying to remember to bring the voice of the voiceless, those who are poor without voices. Because you can imagine at any table where they're making plans, they're not inviting the poor in to help make plans. Mm -hmm. So you need to be there and remember that that's why you're there. That not I remember inside, that's why I'm there. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and I think to wrap things up, um, if you have any big lessons you've learned in the work that you've done, or um, kind of recommendations for people who might be going into the same kind of work and wanting to create change and help with poverty, where would you think is the most important place for people to focus? I think you have to look at two things. What is your charism and what is your talent? Um, and I think that's where you go to work. And you also have to look at, don't think you're taking on the whole huge issue. You take a part of the issue, the part that you can work with, and accept that's what you can do. Um, when I was raising children, I couldn't do as much as I used to do. I did things like made meals for the poor, um, did small things until they were large enough for me to go back in and start doing things larger. So never think that you have to do the whole thing. And that's what makes people say, oh, I can't make, I can't do that, I can't do that. You know, we're all not Mother Teresa. We can't all give up our lives, but we can maybe give a small part, and that's what we do. Thank you so much. You're welcome.